making a recording about the years she remembers at the University of Wisconsin. I came in the fall of 23, in September, and um, I think the student body then was about 7,000 people. And Madison was a town of about 35,000. And um, the streetcar was the main mode of transportation. It ran down State Street and ended out on Monroe Street about, I think, the Dungeon School area, as I remember it. Monroe Street was paved only as far as the railroad tracks, close to the stadium, but the streetcar went further. And uh, it didn't run every 20 minutes. <laughs> as the buses do, but it, it served us very well. And there were taxis, of course. Most of us walked. And uh, for a new co-ed, that was quite a lot of walking from one end of the campus to the other. The thing I re think that was interesting about the student body being only 7,000 was that you recognized faces of people. You didn't always know them, you know, to really talk to them at length, but. He smiled and spoke because they went across the same walk to the same classes day after day that you did. And pretty soon you picked up a boyfriend to walk down the hill with and maybe get an ice cream sundae at Lathrop Hall where they had a cafeteria that served toast and ice cream sundaes with strawberries and ice cream uh, strawberry shortcake and things like that to students. It was more like a snack bar, I suppose. There were restaurants close to the campus where most of the students ate. Um, of course, we didn't have the union then. And there was a one minute restaurant on the corner of University and Park that was popular there. You could buy a ticket for uh, meals for a certain number of weeks. And they called it the one minute restaurant because you were served very quickly. It was somewhat like a one minute food too. That doesn't mean much in, to, in the day of microwaves, but in those days it took longer in a restaurant usually. <clears throat> then um, many of us ate at boarding houses. I ate at a place called Mrs. Seymour's back of the administration building where we paid our, our fees on state and park. She lived in a house there and it was just a lovely place to eat. The um, Kappa House was next door. Many of the Kappas didn't like their food, so they ate there too. And then there was a place on, on State Street where we liked to go called Lawrence's, and they had an orchestra on weekends, a jazz orchestra that was fun to listen to. And of course, there was the Chocolate Shop, which I suppose many of you have heard about, which was a fairy place to children and, and young adults and a place full of calories. Enough of food for the time. I think the student body as a whole was very conscious of the job they had to do, which was getting an education. But there were also lots of parties and lots of fun. And one of the things I think that was really special about the smaller campus was the fact that they had mixers to mix us up. At Lathrop Paul on weekends, Friday afternoon usually, and sometimes Saturday, they had a mixer in the big living room there with some kind of music. Sometimes it was a, a Victrola kind of thing. Sometimes it was a combo. And fellas and girls went in there, not together necessarily, but we danced and danced and danced from about four until dinner time. And my roommates had quite a gimmick. We lived across the street where the St. Francis Clubhouse is on University and Brooks, I guess it is. And um, my roommate would walk home with one of the boys she met there and tell him goodbye and promptly go back and come back an hour later with another one. One time she danced with the same boy and came back with him twice. So. He became a permanent fixture in her life. <clears throat> but there were, those were good for students because it, you didn't have to have a date and, and it was nice. Then, and we, were, we went as we were, no one was dressed up. 
Then they had them also in the old red gym at times. And of course, prom was in the old red gym for a while, and then later at the Capitol, and that was a wonderful experience, which none of us will ever forget. It was as close to being in a fairy castle, I guess, for a girl in her first long finery and, and her very special boyfriend. And we went in taxis that had to be engaged weeks ahead. Several of the boys in the fraternity would go together and have the taxi arranged for the five or six of us that piled in there. Girls always with their finery all folded around them. <clears throat> Those were fun times. Then there were other places to dance on State Street, the Cameo Room and, the, and Boyd's uh, up close to the Unmanone Avenue. And then the football weekends were a big thing because we had the fire, the bonfire on the lower campus where the library is now. And uh, there were the class rushes on that lower campus and the hockey rink was there in the wintertime. We used to walk home from the movies and stop and watch a hockey game. And I can't remember that anybody bought tickets. I think we just went in there and sat down. Anyway, it was fun. And that was my first taste of hockey. And also my first taste of skiing at Wisconsin because I didn't ski myself, but I watched with great envy and admiration that people went down the ski jump. Because I grew up in Illinois where there was very little snow and we hadn't seen any skiing where I lived. <clears throat> And swimming the same way, I learned to swim at the University of Wisconsin. In those days, you had to learn to swim or you couldn't get your degree. So enough of the activities. Uh, well, two more things I'd like to tell because the lakes played such an important part in Madison and in the campus, love of the campus, I think. We took a boat from the foot of Park Street and went across to a place called Bernard's Park, which is now Maple, part of Maple Bluff, and danced at a big pavilion over there and then came back in the moonlight on the boat. That was fun. And then you went um, through, well, sometimes we went through the locks on a boat and went clear down to Lake Wabisa to a dance place, and that was fun. Then there was one across Lake Monona called Esther Beach where we danced. And, he went on the boat and went back on the boat. See, most of the boys didn't have cars in those days, so if they got a car, they had to rent it. And the rental people got so smart, they'd rent it by the hour because they found the students would just get these parks to go and cars to go and park. Instead of driving by the mile, they, they got to charge them by the hour. It was, it was lots of fun for me, who, who had grown up in Illinois and Wisconsin turned out to be a thrilling place to live. Uh, the change of seasons and uh, the geology trips that we took up to the glaciated and unglaciated areas, it was really a great experience. And there were some wonderful professors, all names that most of you know, like Benny Snow and Bill Kekofer and Carl Russell Fish and, and uh, Dean uh, Rowe, some wonderful people. And uh, I had the fortunate experience of having Helen White, one of our most beloved professors, as my advisor as a freshman. She was brand new on the campus and Pronto got a scholarship to go to England to study. So about my second semester, I think she took off. And, and then I had someone in the journalism school since I was a journalism major. There were wonderful people in the journalism department too, Papa Blyer and, and Grant Hyde and uh, some wonderful uh, professors. And strangely enough, you felt close to them. You could talk to them because they were always available. And I think that was true of the administration too. Most of the faculty was very approachable. And it's too bad when a campus gets so large that can't be, you know, there are just too many and there's so much paperwork that it's it's hard to have that today. Someone told me, uh, a man in administration actually told me that my husband was the last one of the presidents to be a faculty president. And I thought he meant someone who came from the faculty. And he said, no, 
someone that a faculty person could get close to and tell his problems to, and usually see some of them ironed out, which was a nice thing, I thought. But that the campus is too big for that now, we understand. Then the town was a beautiful place to be. Madison is a beautiful city. There were lots of nice churches. I lived next door to Luther Memorial when it was just built. And strangely enough, I was sent on a, um, an assignment from the journalism school to report on an annual meeting there. It's, it lasted so long. In those days, we had to sign out if we stayed after 10.30. And I had to get permission, although I only lived next door, to uh, stay long enough to last through the meeting. Luther Memorial was so in debt, they were afraid they were going to just have to fold up. And I sat that meeting out, and I have the this long string I had in the newspaper from it. Um, then they had a, the best organ, I think, in town about that time, too. So we used to go there for vespers. During the week, you could go in, and the organ would be playing. And it was such a beautiful building. It, it was a thrill to me to be close like that to such a lovely place. And I did. I was a congregationalist, so I went to the congregational student house, into the wonderful old congregational church down on Washington Avenue, close to the Grace Episcopal Church, and not too unlike it outside, but very different inside. Of course, we had a beautiful rose window, which I'll never forget. And I wish I knew what happened to it when we got the new church. But I did have the fun of being in on the building of the church on Beach Breeze Terrace. And uh, my husband and I saw the first shovelful dug before we took off for a year in England, where he was to study at Cambridge. And we also saw Glenn Frank dig this first shovel for the Union with his white spats. <laughs> and, and we um, had both of us campaign for that. Union, we'd gone house door to door trying to get money for such a place. And our big talking point was a living room for students because we had had our courtship without any living room. And we knew what that meant. We thought it'd be great for students to have a place to go. And when we came back from England, they had moved into the Union and they had moved into our church. They were all furnished and so it was kind of a neat experience for both of us to, to feel that we'd seen the beginning and now the end of the building. And that church has meant a lot to me ever since, uh, the one in Breeze Heroes. My husband used to say he liked the biochemistry building because he could see the tower of his church from his office. And he questioned when he went up to Bascom Hall whether he was going to be able to do that, but he found he could look out the back and see it. <laughs> so. Uh, we feel like a church spire is an inspiration, and there are lots of them in Madison, all very active churches. Then, as a journalist, I had to learn the initials of all the state and city officials. And it's a strange thing, those, those stick with me today. I had someone who was writing a book the other day call and ask me, um, Governor Blaine's initials. They said they didn't have time to go to the library, and I came forth with them, and they want to know Joe Davies' initials, too. So the things you learn early stay with you. Then, of course, my husband went up very fast in his field. He had some very exciting experiments. And during this time, WARF was formed, which was a very exciting thing to be a part of, too. I heard a good deal of it because of Harry Steinbach in biochemistry, and and uh, my husband was working with them and Professor Hart. And Connie did some very interesting work on iron and copper in relation to anemia about that time. And I was, we were living on Adams Street in a brand new apartment building, 1555 Adams. It's where, it's a triangular building. And I heard them calling on the street, extra, extra. In those days, the newspapers got out extras when there was anything exciting. Of course, we didn't have television, and we didn't really have radio in very many homes at that time, so the extra was the way to tell people about exciting news. 
So I ran out, being a journalist, and bought the newspaper, and here was Professor Hart's picture and a whole story about my husband's work with him on this iron and copper thing. And that work was patented. It was one of the first dwarf patents. It was a very little amount and was divided among four of the Professor Hart and I think four others. But it helped us pay our taxes sometimes. It came about the right time of year. So that was the beginning of war. If I'm reminded of that because Clay Shane fell last night and gave a paper on, on the story of war at Madison Literary Society. And uh, I talked to someone about it this morning and they said it was, it was formed in 1926. I said, I well knew that because that was the year we were married. But then he, after the study in England, which was really an exciting time because he worked with the man who was called the father of vitamins, <coughs> Professor Frederick Gowland Hopkins, who later became a sir, uh, and received the Nobel Prize while we were there. And my husband was in on the celebrations for that. He and his American colleagues got whistles. Professor Hopkins was in, a, was in London, was coming down to Cambridge. He didn't know it until he got to Cambridge. But the boys had gotten wind of it at the lab, so they got whistles and horns. And in Ameri American football fashion, were going to meet him at the train. And some Englishman in intercepted them and said, that will not please Professor Hopkins at all. So they had to be more modest in their admiration for him. But so forth. And We came back then to um, a new job as assistant professor, and a baby was on the way, so we bought a house in Coma and our first car. So it was an exciting year for us. Soon after, um, we decided it was the Depression, and we decided that students needed help, so we always nearly, well, most of the years, I guess, until we went to the president's house, we had students living with us for a room and board, and they also helped us do babysitting and little odd jobs around the house and yard. And some of the closest ties I have with students are, are those 13 students we had lived with us. Some were foreign students, some were, most of them were American, both boys and girls. And it was good for our children as well, I think. The campus was an exciting place to be as a faculty wife, a young faculty wife. There were some interesting things that happened. One I remember is going up to Mrs. Frank's house when, after Glenn Frank became president. And the, the house, the president's house where the Franks lived and our succeeding top administrators of our campus was given to the university when I was in school in the year 1924. It was built in 1910. And uh, I never expected to even be there when I, as a student, I went up there once, I think. But, you know, I, I just never expected I'd ever be in that house. Well, Mrs. Frank had a tea. And uh, Sarah Longenecker, whose husband is, the, uh, who most of you know, is the man who did so much in the Arboretum, the Long Necker Gardens are named after him. He's a very good friend. They were college friends of ours. <clears throat> Went with me to this tea. In those days, every girl had a, or young woman, had a long dress, chiffon-like thing that she wore afternoons to afternoon parties and perhaps a house dress at home and maybe two or three costumes she wore to go to shopping or business purposes and maybe a good pair of shoes and another pair of shoes. I mean it was a small wardrobe for most faculty wives. Remember this was depression. So we went up in our best finery in our long chiffon dresses and I was announced by the butler as Mrs. Albion and uh, that amused us mightily but we went through the receiving line into the dining room and raised our pinkies in the right angle and we're sitting on the radiator bench 
when some of the faculty wives, the older ones, <laughs> came in, I remember sitting next to Mrs. Henry Eubank, Rachel Eubank, and she whispered to me and said, here comes Mrs. So-and-so with her red plush dress. I've seen that every time we've ever had a faculty thing. And that was true. It, it was a kind of a, well, it looked like the red plush they used to have in railroad cars, you know, and this set us off. So we were kind of bad little young brides, but we went out to go home and discovered that it had started to snow, a spring snow, big flakes that would get us very wet. And we, I said to Sarah, I have my best shoes on, we'll ruin them walking home. So at that moment, a bobsled appeared on the hill and there were four or five boys on it. And, we, and Sarah asked if we could ride in the back and we folded our chiffon skirts up and rode down the hill. To, to the foot of the hill and then walked home. When we got to my house, Bo was coming to eat potluck supper with us too that night. We told the boys and they said, well, we'll be looking for new jobs tomorrow if Mary Frank tells that to her husband. So there were lots of good times like that that I remember. The strange thing that I talk, told a story to John Weaver one time after he became president of the university, and he said, you know, I think I was on that bobsled, and so was Tom Mendenhall and, um, and John Bardeen, all of them names that are known in Madison very well, as you know, and many of them other places. So that, that's kind of a fun thing to recall. Then um, the faculty league, university league, was very much a part of my life. I worked for many of the scholarship girls and I enjoyed that work because I thought it was a good work and it kept the faculty wives close and uh, I think it helped them understand what their husbands were up against too in, in the way of, of uh, salary, uh, the small salaries we had and so on. But faculty stayed in, in Madison because they liked Madison and they liked the university and they knew it was a good school. And so there wasn't so much moving around as there is today. It's quite a different thing. My husband had many chances to go away, but we always weighed them all and decided to stay here, probably for less money, but we had so many other things that compensated. Then Danny became the graduate dean and that put a completely different kind of pressure on me because we had to do more entertaining. And uh, he wanted me to be with graduate students when I could. They had many functions, so that was a new experience, but fun. My children were growing up then and past the Girl Scout, Cub Scout age so that um, I could be away from home more. <clears throat> the thing I remember always is the thrill of meeting the wives or the or the professors themselves whom I had had in school. Here I was, you know, with Grant Hyde and Helen Patterson and uh, people I'd looked up to and Dean Rowe. I remember Dean Rowe picking up my hand one day and saying, <clears throat> I see you have an engagement ring. You know, marriage is the best thing that can happen to a girl. And that made me feel very happy and proud. And that was the kind of relationships we had. Then there was Bill Kikofer, whose lecture, if anyone ever took economics, they will never forget his lectures. And to, to be in social functions with him, you know, was just the thrill of my life. And um, Harry Glicksman, and oh, so many of those wonderful people that lived up on, on the hill. Connie wrote me a letter when we were engaged and he was, I was at home and he was in graduate school and said that he had ridden up in the heights with another friend of his and all the professors that were successful were building nice homes up in the heights. He hoped someday he might do that for me. Well, I had never, uh, I guess I didn't register at the time and was after he died some years later, I found this letter. And of course, we never had any ambitions for being in the president's house, but that's where we landed in the top of Prospect Avenue, Hill in the Heights. And it was a lovely place, and the kickovers were back of us, and Grand Hyde and Helen White. Across the street and down the street was um, Glicksman's, <laughs> and 
in uh, Mendenhall House, and one of the young Mendenhalls lived next door. So, you know, it, it was a, a completely surprising experience. Um, when he became president, um, it was with some trepidation for both of us, <clears throat> because we knew it was a big job, and he hated to give up the lab. And I kept sort of remonstrating with him that, why do you, you know, you don't have to do this. But he said, the university's been so good to me, I feel like I owe this to them. And so we did do the job, and, and it was a happy time. Lots of funny things happened. We had a march from the medical school. At the time, they were, thought we were going to oust the medical dean, about a hundred boys in white jackets marched up the hill, and it's a little frightening. It, it probably wouldn't be so frightening today because we've gotten used to marches and, and uh, protests and so forth, but in those days, we, we had a warning. The, the, uh, one of the medical students called us and said, are you home tonight? We're, we'd like to come and see you. And of course, we pictured a few, so I went and put the coffee pot on. We always had cookies ready. It happened to be my husband's birthday, so he asked him if they could postpone it an hour because he was cooking out in the backyard. And Margaret Charger tipped us off in, in the few minutes that there were 100 people marching up the street. So uh, my husband was going to go to the door, and I said, let me go first and see what it's about. And I went to the door, and they took my picture for the Milwaukee Journal. I was very angry because I thought that was is really kind of horrid, but they didn't publish it, I guess. But that was a new experience. Then uh, <clears throat> we had many wonderful people visit us there, and perhaps the biggest thrill for me was the uh, wonderful pianist that I had followed around every place I could ever hear him play. It was Rubenstein, and he was such a delightful person to have. And then uh, we had um, Robert Frost, short, not too long before he died. That was an enriching, wonderful experience. And I'll never forget the things he said, some of them about how can we keep quality with quantity, and how can we keep people from making too quick decisions because the media is whispering in their ear and pushing them all the time. And he had been a journalist, so that was very meaningful to me. My father lived with us for a while there after my mother died, and he was the same age as Robert Frost. So Robert Frost said, let's two octogenarians control the conversation. We're both deaf. And he said, well, we'll stand up and we'll each get a chance to ask people a question. They have to answer us, and we can hear them when they talk one at a time. So they did this, and it was quite a challenge to all of us because their questions were very good. <clears throat> but that kind of thing was part of our life, and it was very exciting and enriching. And one time we had had very, very warm day, and I had been asked to speak in a, at a Baraboo church breakfast. And had, we'd gotten a new car, had just arrived that day, so I was the first one to take it on the road, and I loved to drive, so it was a big thrill. And I, all the way up there, I was trying to think what I was going to say. I thought it was to be just a, a sort of a nice get-together, and I would be equipped for the, for the kind of thing I had to do. Well, when I got there, I saw on the program that I was supposed to talk on how much is enough. And it kind of threw a challenge at me, but I so I didn't enjoy my breakfast very much during the time. <clears throat> but I, I thought it went off fairly well, and I went home very happy. And my husband said, "You have to go to the engineers. Uh, you have to go to the philosophy banquet tonight because I have to go to the engineering banquet." And we had agreed we would never do this; that we would go together to things like that. But it had to be. It was very, very warm, and it was at the center building when it was brand new and they hadn't the air conditioning ready yet. So the first thing I did that night when they introduced me as the first lady was to tell the men they could please me by taking their coats off. And I got it, my first skyrocket. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> that was fun. And then I went back. I had 
gotten a new maid that day who uh, had come from far north, never been in Madison before, and she was frightened of the whole house. And I said, you just have fun tonight and experiment, look around, there'll be no one here, and I'll come home, you know, reasonable time, so. Well, I hadn't had to have a key before, and so I got home and the place was locked. I rang the bell for her, and she came down, poor dear, frightened to death, not knowing which door to come to. And shortly after, my husband came, and we both were so happy to to shower and get into bed because it was such a hot night. When just had probably fallen asleep when the telephone rang, and it was the union, and they said they had two Japanese professors over there who had no place to go, and they had come to see one of our well-known professors, and they couldn't. Two Japanese professors did not speak English. They had a, an, only the name of the professor they were to see written in a paper. And my husband said, well, please take them to the university club and put them up tonight because we have a new maid and we're going to the library school breakfast. This was in May when everything blossoms out all over on campus. So they said they would, and we went back to sleep. Pretty soon the telephone rang again. And I got out of bed knowing full well we were going to have these men as guests in the bedroom that was made up was covered with my daughter's wedding gifts. She was to be married in the month of May, and we had put all her presents there until she came home to unwrap them. So I began moving presents, and my husband finally said, yes, we are gonna get the two Japanese men. So I went back to bed, and he said, I'll go to the door, and which he did in his robe. Well, these Japanese professors, of course, didn't know who he was, and I think they thought he was probably the butler or something. They rushed in and looked all around and see if it was a fit place to stay, and finally he took them up to this bedroom, which had its own bath and two and twin beds, and they said, two rooms, please. So then he came to me again and said, what do we do now? <laughs> and I said, well, there's a room on the third floor, and the bed is made up, but oh goodness, the new maid's up there with her door open between the two. So I ran up to tell her and she said, we rushed out of bed and said, e and locked the door. And uh, <clears throat> out we went to bed again, feeling everything was under control and just got to sleep and we heard the bell again. My husband put on his robe and went downstairs and this time there was no one there, so we didn't know what had happened until we realized that there was a bell pull in this bedroom for the maid, and probably the Japanese had gotten up in the night and thought it was a light pull, and he had pulled it and rang the bell. And my husband's comment was, well, now you have to go. I think they want geisha girls. <laughs> so that was the kind of thing. In the morning, they... My, we wakened my son that night also, who was a student, and said, you will have to take them to the university in the morning to the union for breakfast, because we're going to go to the library school breakfast. And he, he said he would. Well, he, in the morning, got them downstairs with their luggage, and they waited for him to put the luggage in and to open and shut the door. They thought he was a chauffeur. And then they asked that the one man who spoke a little English asked where was the most historical spot in Madison. And he was going by Camp Randall, but he didn't even think of that. He, he, he showed him the historical library. And uh, they got out on the steps of the Union, waited for him to open the door, and then presented him with a gift, which uh, he accepted, and it was a fan, and he, which amused him mightily. But the strange thing was these were very, very famous Japanese professors, and they really never knew they were in the president's house. They thought they were at a hotel or something. So that was just one of the funny experiences. Another time we had a tea, and uh, it was run by the Home Economics Association, and I was, it was summertime, I was out on the porch helping the girls check in the people. They were paying dues and signing their names for name tags. And some women came up to me and <clears throat> kept saying she, something about she admired me so much and she wanted to do something. And I was sort of embarrassed, so I carried her into the party, introduced her to the governor's wife, and then left her. 
I came back out on the porch and five minutes later there she was beside me again and I realized she had a kind of a shopping bag, um, a shoestring bag, you know, with uh, something in it. And she reached in there and handed me some mint. And she said, this is to plant in your garden. And she hadn't been invited to the party at all. She just came to give me this mint. And I don't know to this day who she is. I've never been allowed to tell that story much because it might be one of my best friends, friends or something. <coughs> But there were a lot of strange incidents like that, and, and it, was, it was just like living a whole new life. Another time when Rubenstein came, uh, the students had him come up to the house afterwards in Van Taylor, <coughs> and uh, we had musicians from, that would enjoy knowing him for dinner. He liked to have dinner after his concerts, and uh, he preferred to eat steak, but I just thought I couldn't give the Madison people steak at that time of night, but we had everything prepared and we were excited about it because, as I say, I had been a fan of his for so long. And we went to the concert and he had the chauffeur there to pick him up <coughs> afterwards. And I suddenly had stage fright when Louise Lockwood turned around to me and said, Connie, how does it feel to be going to entertain the greatest pianist in the world? And I just went cold, and I thought, you know, who am I, a little girl from Illinois? But uh, I whispered to my husband and said, we don't know how we're going to meet him. And he said, oh, Van will take care of that. Well, sure enough, the usher came and told us that we would meet him in his dressing room. Well, I was the typical, you know, fluttery dowager. I rushed in and said, how do you do, Mr. Rubenstein? And we have a car waiting for you. And uh, and we will allow you time to change. And he looked at me and said, why, I'm not a sweaty pianist. And he came as he was. <laughs> and that was so typical of him. He just amused us all evening long with anecdotes, a lot of fun. That was a big evening in my life. Well, life progressed in the President's house and there were lots of exciting moments for both of us and some discouraging ones because Money was hard to get for the university, as it is, has been always, and <clears throat> we entertained the legislators. We did everything we knew, but still, and, and Connie spent hours and hours of preparation to meet with the legislature, and he got very angry once and said, how do you, how in the hell do you expect me to run this university without any money, right, in the meeting, which I never thought I would hear him say. But it shows that how frustrating it was. And it's, it's ever thus with any administrator, I guess, of a big university. <clears throat> then suddenly one morning, I had a husband, and an hour later he was gone of a heart attack. So I had the arduous task of getting out of that big house and taking an inventory of the university things in my home. And I had my 87-year-old father living with me, and our son was still at home. And uh, so we had to buy a house and, and move out. But rewarding things came after that in my life. I've had a very interesting life since, and it's been in Madison, except for some wonderful trips. The Alumni Association started taking European tours, and they asked me to be the hostess on some. And I had some wonderful experiences with 30 alumni on a tour. We went to. Central Europe, and uh, another one to Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, and Russia, another one down under to New Zealand and Australia and Tahiti and Hawaii, and then I took some on my own to Mexico and Spain and so forth. All alumni tours and very wonderful and rewarding experiences with people that liked our university. Then I was given another plus. Uh, I was asked to be on the University Board of Visitors, which uh, was not an important body in that it was a governing body, but it was a good kind of a catalyst and also a thermometer for the university student body and teaching assistants. During the time when there were the protests and the strikes, we often heard about them and had people, the students or the teaching assistants, tell us 
what was coming off before the administration really knew it. It was a good thing. But the most exciting thing to me was the chance to hear all the Blue Ribbon professors tell about their work, their latest research, and their, we'd go to the engineering school and see the beginning of the computer, little tiny microwave or micro little chips, you know, that would go on the end of our finger and so on. And um, we went to the other campuses because it was before the system was formed and it was fun to see how they were struggling, some of them to get along and, and uh, now to see how they've grown is, is really exciting. I think perhaps the Board of Visitors' best thing during the time I was there, the most valuable work we did was to make a survey of all the research monies that come in to the our university and see how much is channeled and how much research is funded by outside sums. And I know the Dean of the Graduate School had given us this assignment and he felt it was a very worthwhile study. The board has become a little different kind of board now, so it doesn't function the same way. I happened to be president of the board for the two years when we were really not legal. The University Board of Visitors was was um, founded by the legislature in the 1800s, and 18, I've forgotten the exact date, let's say 70s. And when the system was formed, then we didn't really work legally as an existing body. And we could have folded up and gone away, but we decided to stay by with some of the advice and some of the administration and just uh, have our meetings and do our assignments and until we became legal, and, and that's what happened. And when uh, President um, Weaver and some of the other members of, of the uh, young, and, uh, and I guess I can't remember whether uh, we met with Shane before or not, but all of us, they all decided they would like to have a the Board of Visitors, and I have served on that for a good many years. Now we have been called the Board of Visitor of Maritime. We don't quite know what that means, but we've been to one meeting, and they say we can come to any one of their meetings and sit in if we want to and not vote. So that was a nice experience. And it was like going to college again, because I got a whole new look at the campus and all aspects of it. And then I was fortunate enough to know Paul Ginsburg rather well because I worked with him on some student committees on all night hours and uh, some of the things that and they wanted the, the students wanted the library open all night things that some of the campus people couldn't understand and Paul was so good to explain and I felt so rewarded to have known him that much. He's just retiring and I hate to see him go. Then Madison, of course, has changed. We went from movie houses to civic centers and all sorts of exciting new things and one-way streets and uh, outside band concerts, which I love. Many things that, that we see today that are a big improvement in some of the things we did. I, I miss some of the things that where Madison is a small town but that's true every place, and that's progress, I guess. I what would that. you bring back? If you could bring back one thing that's gone, what would you bring back? I would bring back the student faculty, really. You mean to Madison or to mm -hmm. the campus? To the campus or to the city. I'd bring back the student faculty <clears throat> closeness. And I don't see that isn't there now because some faculty members are, are good at that, you know, some better than others, but you can't do it with so many. And I would see better counseling than they get now, and I don't think we had the greatest. It's been the lack all the way along, but this university teaches so much, and there's so much. How can any one advisor know everything to advise his students? And I think that's not just true of our campus, it's true of all campuses. My grandson's at Minnesota and he was telling me when he was here he needs more counseling, so I'm sure that's true. 
And then I think I would bring back things like prom. I liked that kind of thing. We got to know many students that way. And it was such an interesting and exciting kind of a thing for students to dress up. And perhaps that's not very, it's, it's kind of a mundane thing, but it, it was a big thing in my life anyway. Of course, I was terribly in love, so everything I did was exciting <laughs> then. Uh, then I, I would like to see us have more town participation in the campus. That has gone some because of the bigness. It used to be when you had a visitor, even if you weren't a, a faculty person, you would take everyone up to see the newest building or go over the campus. Well, it's an experience now with all the students crossing 49,000 of them. And, and you just don't do it like you used to. You can't stop in front of Lincoln and, and show them the view from there like you used to. So there are a lot of things like that. that I'm glad they've preserved things like Music Hall. That's great. And the Union has been a great addition to the campus. I'm proud of that. It had some rugged days during the protests, but it weathered the storm, and it's still a good place for students and, and townspeople to meet. I think I would hope that we could have a beautiful campus always, that they don't spoil it with too many high rises and that they keep the landscaping. It is lovely now. They're doing a very good job, I think. And I'm proud of the Arboretum. That's a wonderful thing for the city of Madison, the state, the nation. And of course, I can't help but be proud of the Elvium Art Center because I think it's, now we call it the Elvium Art Museum, which is a better name. And um, it's, it's uh, acquired world fame and we're proud of that. I think we put too much emphasis on sports, but I enjoy them, so I can't fault them either. But I think we have to get a little better balance of that. But I'm proud that Wisconsin insists on scholarship for their athletes. And that may be why we don't have better teams, but so if they're going to school, they're going to learn. And I just think we think too much in America about winning always. If we could just know that it's the game that's the fun and the game of life. It isn't all winning, we all know, but um, what fun it can be. And I think perhaps I was so fortunate to come here. I was going to Smith and I passed my college board exams. My mother had always told me I was going to Smith and I never questioned that. And I came up here to Lake Ripley one summer with my family and some friends. And I thought Wisconsin was lovely. And we came to see the campus. And I was just fell in love with that. And I kept thinking, I wish I could go there. But I never really said that to my parents because I was just understood I was going to Smith. <clears throat> and after passing my college board exams, I'm not so sure I got the best grade in chemistry, but I passed. I got word from Smith in the 1st of August of the year I was to go there that they could not accept me. They were full of their Eastern quotas. And so they put me on the waiting list for the next year. So my parents said, where will you go? We had Millican University at home in Illinois, 60 miles away. We were Congregationalists, so Oberlin looked pretty good. And I said, I want to go to the University of Wisconsin. And my, my mother said, why? You don't know anyone there? And I said, well, I want to take journalism. They don't give that at Smith, which is true. They didn't. And my teachers had told me I should. So my, my dad called up a classmate of his who was teaching in the Spanish department, Professor C.D. Cool. And he said, called, we used to call him China Cool. And, um, because he can speak Chinese, I guess, as well as Spanish. So he said, of course, we have one of the best uh, journalism schools in the country. So the die was cast, and we came up the next week and got me a place to live, and here I came. And I met my husband the first two weeks I was here. 
And so, there was no ever getting me to Smith. <laughs> well, I'm glad it worked out that way. <clears throat> and with Connie's customary modesty, she doesn't state what a gracious hostess she was. Hardly anybody has been able to live up to her and her years of devotion to the campus as a, on the Board of Visitors and also to the community. And she always put somebody else's welfare first. Even did this interview today with a sore throat just because she said she would. Thank you, Connie, for everything. That's very nice. Thank you. <clears throat> that deserves.